Good afternoon or good day to everybody, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to have Tom Pauls on the ESOU online module. He will give us a state of the art on the development of EO in metastatic urinary cancer. So we are listening to you. Thank you for accepting the invitation, Thomas. Thank you for inviting me. It's a super uh, complicated time. There's been so much data coming out. I'm going to do my best to summarize it in 15 minutes, but bear with me, bear with me. I have a number of disclosures, as you can imagine. The first chapter was in second line setting. We saw the immune checkpoint inhibitors, both PDL1 and PD1 therapies, supersede chemotherapy in this space. It's important to remember that pembrolizumab was the only randomized phase three trial that was positive. The atezolizumab program pursued a PDL1 biomarker approach that was unsuccessful. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind because we haven't been successful with biomarker-driven trials with immune therapy so far. The drugs had more similarities than differences. The response rate was modest, but there were long-term durable remissions and they were well tolerated. And I think it's widely agreed that these drugs, particularly pembrolizumab, have superseded frontline treatment. Uh, so, sorry, second line, cisplatin refractory treatment. And this is the cisplatin refractory study for pembrolizumab. It's actually a very small randomized phase three with terrific data, as you can see. We moved very quickly with these drugs into the frontline setting. On single arm trials, the atezolizumab study, Keynote 210, pembrolizumab, Keynote 52. They were both licensed in biomarker positive cisplatin ineligible frontline disease. There was always some nervousness around the size of these trials because remember the response rate for chemotherapy is more like 50% and we're not really seeing that here. And so these biomarker driven trials were also made us nervous because there was uncertainty around the performance of the biomarker. So we did four randomized phase three studies, three of which are reported. I'm gonna summarize those for you today. The first was the atezolizumab study. So this is the combination of chemotherapy plus immune therapy. And you can see here, modest progression-free survival advantage. It was statistically significant, but 0.82, only an 18% reduction, 1,400 patient studies required to achieve these results. And again, OS was relatively modest and not yet significant. Remember, and look at these curves, they don't go apart until the chemotherapy finishes. And that's quite important. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. The response rate for the chemotherapy doesn't show a big bounce. 44 for chemotherapy alone, chemotherapy plus immune therapy, only a 3% increase. Whereas monotherapy, immune therapy, 23% response rate. So the two together are certainly not synergistic or even additive, I would argue. And we have similar data for chemotherapy with or without pembrolizumab. And you can see here some progression-free survival benefit, but not statistically significant and not practice changing. And again, the survival curves, not practice changing. And so it's fair to say at the end of that chapter, that the chemotherapy immune combination has not been synergistic or additive as we saw in lung cancer and has been disappointing and hasn't changed practice. What about the immune monotherapy? So this is a PD-1 or PDL one by itself in biomarker positive patients. This is the Danube trial. So this is duvalimab versus chemotherapy in the frontline setting. And here you can see the chemotherapy outperforming the immune therapy to start with. The chemotherapy has a higher response rate. It has longer progression-free survival. The immune therapy catches up, but it's too late. The trial's negative. It's not statistically better than chemotherapy alone and therefore can't be recommended at this point, despite the attractive shape of the curve. And the reason why, as I said before, is the response rate in red, 26%, half that of chemotherapy. The chemotherapy has done a lap of the park before the, uh, the Juvalimab gets out of bed. No wonder it's struggling to catch up. The problem is if you give it with chemotherapy, it doesn't seem better either. The pembrolizumab data in their biomarker positive cohort, the hazard ratio of one, again, the immune therapy not performing as well as chemotherapy initially, catching up, but it's too late. 
So in summary, monotherapy in biomarker positive patients has not been enough to get over the line because the chemotherapy is good at the start of the disease. This is the combination of juvalimab and tremilimumab together. And what you can see here in the biomarker positive population is you can see that the juvalimab is being boosted by the tremilimumab. The results are slightly better. This is not statistically significant, it's exploratory, but there are IPNEVO trials in the biomarker positive setting in the future, which are super exciting and I think may be positive. CTLA-4 inhibition, in my opinion, has a role in this disease. So if we're not using those first two approaches frequently, what are we going to use instead? Well, this is the maintenance of Valimab program. So four to six cycles of chemotherapy, stable disease or response, and then randomization to a Valimab or best supportive care, survival, the primary endpoint, hazard ratio of 0 0.69. This is the lowest hazard ratio we've seen in urothelial cancer with a seven month improvement in disease for an overall survival great landmark data. The forest plot analysis show that it works with irrespective of chemotherapy, gem cis or gem carbo, response to therapy, stable disease versus partial response, and indeed pdl one status, biomarker positive, biomarker negative. Disease-free survival was also significant. Look at that plateau. That's quite compelling. And this is important because a number, a large number of these patients went on to get subsequent chemotherapy and immune therapy. It's important to remember that not all patients get the second line, immune, second line therapy, only a minority in our center. And so there is an issue around giving the treatment early rather than waiting for the cancer to come back. And indeed, this is the quality of life data and you can see no significant difference in quality of life. This is EQ5D comparing immune therapy with Avalimab and best supportive care. 20 seconds about the future. Infortumab vedotin, an antibody drug conjugate with excellent activity in platinum refractory and pdl one experienced patients. 40% response rate. We know this trial here, a randomized phase three versus best supportive versus chemotherapy in these patients who've progressed on chemotherapy and immune therapy. We know this trial is positive. We don't know the results yet. In Fortumab, Vodotin is going to become an established second line treatment because most patients in the frontline setting are going to get chemotherapy and Evalimab, then in Fortumab, Vodotin. So bladder cancer is changing every six months. And then finally, there's the FGF inhibition for those individuals with FGFR alterations, different drugs, erdofitinib with FDA approval, but also randomized trials such as Thor comparing erdofitinib with um, standard of care. Really important personalized therapy in urothelial cancer. These are the European guidelines, which actually support the approach, the strong approach, chemotherapy, followed by maintenance of Alimab, atezolizumab and pembrolizumab with level 3b data. It's hard to choose which patients we should be giving frontline immune therapy for. As I said before, we're not getting in control of the majority of patients. How do we summarize this? Well, immune therapy certainly established in the second line setting. Frontline immune therapy doesn't seem good enough and the biomarkers don't seem to work well enough to supersede chemotherapy. Chemotherapy plus immune therapy combinations have been disappointing, as has the biomarker, and therefore this maintenance approach appears the most attractive. The world is super exciting. Infortumab vedotin is going to come in and change that combination of frontline trials, erdofitinib the same. We're going to combine these and we're going to change bladder cancer forever. Many thanks for your attention. Um, so uh, maybe Ashish uh, or Alexandra, uh, you would like to uh, discuss one point of the presentation with Paul in particular. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, Tom always does a great job in, in that summary was very succinct and, and right on the money. I, I do want to ask Tom a question about the javelin. I know he's probably heard this question multiple, multiple times. Um, what it really do you think is the true benefit of maintenance in the real world outside the trial setting parameters within the study? And, and, and what I'm asking is, you know, in the real world where patients are treated you know, variously, uh, do you think that we will see this same benefit or do you think that post-approval uh, studies will also be important? I think it's a terrific question. 
one of the things which I've always been surprised about uh, is the proportion of patients who actually get to second line therapy. Um, and we, we, we are bought into the frontline chemotherapy concept. We then do scans every three or four months. Some patients miss a scan or whatever. And, and second line treatment is really hard to do. It's not easy to get in control of those patients. And there are many patients who you know about who have rapidly progressive disease and you give immune therapy and actually they doesn't make a huge difference. Remember the, um, the huge um, atezolizumab study, um, which had a thousand patients in it, the hazard ratio of second line versus chemotherapy was in the 0 0.8. And the vinflunin subset didn't seem to be particularly strong either and against vinflunin. So what I'd say is that actually second line immune therapy, I think is too late, even for those that can get it. So I actually think bringing the drugs forward is important. The other piece of sheet, which is, you know, renal cancer, progression-free survival is often 15 months on first line therapy. Progression-free survival in bladder cancer is only six months. And that includes the time on chemotherapy. And those PFS curves are super steep. So you're only talking about giving four or five additional cycles because the majority of patients are going to progress. So I actually feel that you know, there's the response, as soon as we stop the chemotherapy, I think the cancer starts to drift back. And I think by giving maintenance immune therapy, we can capture some additional patients that we otherwise might lose. Now, do I think there's some biological reason why maintenance therapy is better? That's a more difficult discussion. Do I think in the community, there are very strong practical reasons about trying to identify those patients who can get long-term durable responses with immune therapy? Yes, I do. So I'm very supportive of that. And if I could follow Thanks. up with another slightly provocative question, uh, yes, not to in spawn, Tom, but do you think that in patients that, and, and this is in an earlier setting, but in the new adjuvant setting, giving chemotherapy, looking at a response, and then potentially putting these patients on maintenance IO clearly needs to be studied, but do you think that's a pathway to organ preservation? I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant question. Um, I would like to see that. You know, I would really like to see Dervatremi trials in, um, in Ipinevo trials neoadjuvantly. I'd also like to see some triplet trials um, with chemotherapy plus Dervatremi or EV plus Dervatremi or Adafitinib plus Dervatremi in the neoadjuvant setting. I'd like us to see us hit that cancer really, really hard early on. And then, as you say, get into then a place where we can get in long-term control. And I think it's possible. Um, we're not there quite yet. And to be honest, we haven't really designed the right trials. I think the first tranche of trials around proving that the drugs work in this setting is important. And coming back to your presentation previously, I think single arm trials probably aren't going to answer that question robustly enough. But I would see neoadjuvant triplets control and then regular cystoscopy, plus or minus radiotherapy, whatever it might be, as a, a way of trying to pursue that approach and we need to do that and we're not doing well enough. I also think by the way circulating tumor DNA has a role to play in this. I think that is a good surrogate marker in your ethereal cancer. There was a nice piece of work out of Denmark. We published some work recently uh, around that in the neoadjuvant setting. I think CT DNA has a really important role to play in monitoring the disease with chemotherapy and indeed with immune therapy. Alexandra, any comments from your side? No comments. Uh, Tom, I have a question because you are a medical oncologist, so you have a broad vision of what's going on in the field of cancer. And if we step back a little bit from bladder cancer, we all know that all these drugs are used not only in bladder cancer, but in many, many cancers, even outside the field of oncology. Do you really believe, but it's your, I would say, subjective perception of the, the situation, do you really believe there is room at, uh, at the end of the day, ultimately, for these drugs in the field of bladder cancer? And we they will come up uh, with a huge improvement in the management of, the, uh, of our patient with bladder cancer. Well, thank you for the question. Two ways of answering that. The first question is if you come to my, you'd be very welcome. I'd love, I wish you could come to my clinic. We'd go out for a beer afterwards. If you could no. come to my clinic on a Tuesday afternoon, there's a room full of people who have, we've treated maybe five or 600 people now. There's a room full of people who continue on follow-up or continue on therapy, who progressed on frontline chemotherapy um, uh, and had got second-line immune therapy and, an, and are in long-term durable remission. And those patients weren't here 10 years ago. And so it has been transformative 
currently for about 20% of patients. So the answer is yes, even now, this has had a major impact on urothelial cancer. Do I think in Fortumabodotin, the CGLA4, FGF, PDPDL1, do I think those four groups of drugs are gonna, gonna cure or put more patients into durable remission? Yes, I do. I think we can get that to 30 or 40% over the next five years. And I also think we have to look at the adjuvant data. We'll also need to look at the EV plus Pembro frontline data. I also think we can do better than that still. And remember the overall survival in bladder cancer, even in the control arms of these chemo plus immune therapy studies, is still between 12 and 14 months. I do a lot of kidney cancer too. You know, we're looking at 42 month outcome data in some of those patients with 33% being in long-term durable remission. We are miles away in urothelial cancer as it currently stands. And as she said before, with biomarker development and drug development, going rapidly in parallel with the pharmaceutical industry and investigation initiated trials, we really can make a big difference in the next five years in urothelial cancer. Thank you very much, Tom, for your brilliant presentation. And it will uh, close the, this last part of uh, ESOU online module. Thank you very much.